In this lecture, I'll talk about the structure spectrum, I'll talk about the formats and performance for files, we'll look at tabular data, some examples, the challenges of working with tabular data, and PySpark support for tabular data in the form of data frames. And then we'll look at log files. So in review, the big picture is we have a data warehouse, and from that data warehouse, we'd like to extract data products, analytics, and business intelligence. We get information into the data warehouse by performing extract, transform, and load operations on application databases, files, and logs. Now, some of the key data management concepts that we want to consider are a data model. This is a collection of concepts for describing data, and a schema, which is a description of a particular collection of data using a given data model. Now, information spans a structure spectrum, ranging from unstructured or schema-never data. This is information that has no structure and never will have structure, and includes things like plain text and media. Semi-structured or structure-later data includes things like documents, extensible markup language, uh, content, and tag text or media. The last structure element is structured data, and this is schema-first data. This includes things like relational databases and formatted messages. Today, we will look at semi-structured data or schema-later data, where we apply a schema after we create that data. Files are a named sequence of bytes. They're typically stored as a collection of pages or blocks. A file system is a collection of files organized within a hierarchical namespace. And a file system is responsible for laying out those bytes on physical media, storing the file metadata, and providing an application programming interface for interaction with files. API operations include open, close, seek, read, and write. Now, files are organized in a hierarchical namespace. In Linux, forward slash is the root of a file system, and on Windows, backslash is the root of a file system. Files and directories have associated permissions, but it's important to recognize that files are not always necessarily arranged in a hierarchical namespace. For example, in content addressable storage, which is often used for large multimedia collections, we refer to the content by its content, not necessarily by its hierarchical name. Now, some considerations for a file format are, what are the data models? Is it tabular, hierarchical, or array? What is the physical layout? What are the field units and validation? What metadata do we need to store? For example, header or side file or specification or other information. What types of data do we want to store in the files? Are they plain text or binary files? What do we use as delimiters for fields? And how do we escape special content or characters? Are the files compressed, or do they use encryption? Or do we have checksums that we can use to validate that the files have not been tampered with or damaged? And finally, how do we evolve the format or the schema for the file? Semi-structured tabular data is one of the most common data formats. A table is a collection of rows and columns. Each row has an index, and each column has a name. A cell is specified by an index name pair, and a cell may or may not have a value. The type of a cell is inferred from its value. Here's an example of tabular data. This is Fortune 500 companies. These are the top 500 US closely held and public corporations by gross revenue. What you can see from this table is that there are different columns, for example, rank, company name, uh, revenue, and there are different rows for each company that's in this tabular data. Now, we can take and export this data as a comma-separated value file. That file looks like this, and it consists of a header row that consists of the columns separated by commas, the column names, and then rows consisting of values for each one of those columns separated by commas. Each company is on a different row. Here's a different exported file. This is from a protein data bank. And here, the format is different. The format is the first column of a line is the field name followed by values. And field names can be repeated on multiple lines. Working with tabular data introduces several challenges. The format may not be well-defined. It may be missing data values. 
Types may be incorrectly inferred, so for example, if a cell contains 2 instead of 2.0, the type might incorrectly be inferred as integer. And then there's no support for versioning of the format, and many other challenges that you'll have to face. When you have tabular data from multiple sources, there are additional challenges that you may face. Not every source may provide the same data, which means that some fields may be missing. There may be inconsistent data types between the different sources. So one file may have dollar values, while another file has pound values. There also may be inconsistent values for the same entity. One file may refer to the supermarket company Walmart as wall-mart, whereas the other file refers to them as Walmart, all one word. When you get tabular data from sensors, there are additional challenges. They may be missing fields. For example, a given sensor might not produce all of the different types of data. So some sensors may produce temperature and humidity, while other sensors pr provide temperature, humidity, and light. A sensor may be damaged, either permanently or intermittently, and timestamps may be inaccurate or incorrect between different sensors. Other metadata for the sensors may also have errors, for example, the location of a sensor or its identification code, and sensors may periodically go offline for a while, leading to gaps in the data. Pandas is an open source data analysis and modeling library that's an alternative to using R. Pandas provides data frames, which are a table with named columns. It's the most commonly used Pandas object, and it's represented as a Python dictionary that maps column names to series. Each Pandas series object represents a column, and you can think of it as a one-dimensional labeled array that's capable of holding any data type. R also has a similar data frame type. Spark introduced data frames in Spark 1.3 as an extension to RDDs. They're a distributed collection of data that's organized into named columns. So they're equivalent to pandas in R data frames, but they're distributed. And the types of columns are inferred from values. It's very easy to convert between pandas and PySpark data frames. One important consideration, however, is that when you convert from a Spark data frame to a pandas data frame, you have to make sure that that pandas data frame will fit in the driver's memory. Here is the code that you would use to convert a Spark data frame into a pandas data frame and to create a Spark data frame from a pandas data frame. As you can see, it's very straightforward and easy to do. The performance difference between using data frames and RDDs is significant. Here's a graph that shows the performance of aggregating 10 million integer pairs in seconds on the x-axis. And it shows the performance for, in blue, RDDs using Python and Scala bindings, and in green, performance using Python and Scala bindings with data frames. And you can see that performance with data frames is almost five times better than the performance using RDDs for PySpark. So when you have a choice between using data frames and using RDDs for large data, you're better off using data frames in most, most cases. Semi-structured log files are created by printf statements in server processes. And these include processes like web servers, database servers, network file servers, and components of the operating system. All of these generate these semi-structured log files that consist of human-readable text format files. Now, this is a little ironic because it's very rare for a human to actually read one of these log files. And so oftentimes, they're stored or archived in binary or compressed formats. Now, the format is either published in a specification or defined by the code. And as a result, this can make it very difficult to parse a semi-structured log file because the format can change at any time, and uh, any time the code is changed or any time the specification is changed. So remember, we looked at earlier in, the, in this course the Apache web server log. And you can see that each line here consists of a request that's being made from a client to the server. Let's go through this. This file is defined by the Apache common log format. It specifies the log format file. And here's an example line from that file. The first component is the client IP address. The second and the third components are the user identity from the remote machine. And a hyphen means that that is not available. The next component is, that, is the user identity from a local logon and a hyphen means that's not available. The next component is the request time, and this is broken up into a date, a time, 
and a time zone. The next component is a client request, and this consists of the request method, so get, post, put, and so on. The endpoint, this is a uniform resource identifier which specifies what content the client is trying to retrieve. And then finally, the client protocol version. The last two components are a status code that the server sends back to the client, and 200 means it, everything went okay. But there are other status codes, like the 300 series, the 400 series, and the 500 series. The last component is the size of the object that's returned to the client. And this is a hyphen if no content is returned, or sometimes a zero. I have that underlined and bolded because this is one of the things that makes parsing this, this kind of data difficult. Because sometimes it'll be a hyphen, sometimes it'll be a zero, you never know which one to expect. You have to expect both. In one of the labs for this course, you'll be exploring a web server access log from NASA, the space agency in America. This log covers 21 days and includes over a million requests. We've partially cleaned the log for you to help, help you by removing some of the very hard to parse requests. Now, with a log like this, there are many different questions that you could ask. For example, what are the statistics for the content that's being returned, the sizes or the statuses? What types of return codes occur? How many 404, that's page not found, errors are there? Those are important because that indicates that someone wasn't able to find something that they were looking for. But you can also ask a lot of temporal questions, like how many unique hosts were there per day? Or how many requests were there per day? Or on average, how many requests were there per host? Or how many 404 errors were there on a daily basis? Here's an example of a system log file from a machine. And you can see that there are multiple applications running on this machine. And you can also see some of the system operations that are happening on this machine. Now, we can collect these types of files from many machines and then check them for unusual events like disk errors, network congestion, or security attacks. We can also monitor the resources on the machines from these files, looking at things like the network, the memory, the disk, the CPU, or application queues. We can take all of that information and we can visualize it with a dashboard. So for example, here is a dashboard from Splunk which provides a free version of its enterprise software that you can download and try with your own data. One of the most important considerations for a file format is performance. Now when you think about file format in terms of performance, consider the read versus the write performance the performance for plain text versus binary format, the environment that you use, Python versus Scala or Java, and uncompressed versus compressed. So here's an example using a 626 megabyte text file, and a 787 megabyte binary file, and two environments, a Python environment using Pandas and a Scala Java environment. Now on the first line, we see the Python performance and we can see that the read time for the text version of the file, for a text file, is 36 seconds. The write time is 45 seconds. There's no times for binary reading the, of the binary file because Pandas does not have a binary file I.O. library, which means that the performance that you're going to see for Python will depend on which particular library that you choose to use. Now for Scala and Java, we see that the read time is 18 seconds and the write time is 21 seconds for the text file, and the read time is 1 to 6 seconds for the binary file, and 1 to 6 seconds for the write of the binary file. Now the difference here in, in range from 1 to 6 seconds is because 6 seconds is the time for when we're doing sustained reading and writing of a file, when it's not cached in a system cache. But if it gets cached in the system cache, we'll see much faster performance, when dealing with, especially when dealing with binary files. Now, overall, we can see that the read and write times are quite comparable between Python and also for Scala and, and Java. However, we notice that binary I.O. is much, much faster than text I.O. In fact, it's, almost an or, it's more than an order of magnitude greater performance when dealing with binary files instead of textual files. Looking at file performance when we're using compression, 
Here we have a table that shows the performance when using the Scala and Java languages. The upper table shows a binary file, that 787 megabyte file. The lower table shows the text file, 626 megabytes in size. Now for each of these files, we look at performance for raw I.O. versus using LZ4 with the fast setting versus using gzip with a different levels of compression. Now the first thing that we can observe when we look at this table is that write times are much larger than read times. That is, it takes much longer to write a compressed file than to read a compressed file. The second observation we can make is that there's a large range of compression times. So gzip level one only takes 14 seconds to write, whereas gzip level six takes 75 seconds to write. The next observation we can make is that different compression schemes, LZ4 versus gzip, also have different times. So it's only four seconds for LZ4 compression, which is less than even gzip level one compression. The next observation is that there's a very small range of compressed file sizes, ranging from 328 megabytes to 286. There's only a 15% range of compression even though the time varies from 14 seconds to 75 seconds to write, and they have the same read times. We also observe that binary I.O. is still much faster than text-based I.O. So four seconds for LZ4 versus 24 seconds for LZ4 with a text file. The same thing for reading. Reading is much faster with a binary file, two seconds versus 22 seconds for the text file. Another interesting observation is that LZ4 compression is very close to the raw I.O. speed. So only four seconds for writing versus a range of one to six seconds for writing the raw file. The same thing is true for doing reading. Reading is only two seconds using LZ4 versus one to six seconds for the binary file. In summary, uncompressed read and write times are comparable. Binary I.O. is much faster than text I.O and compressed reads are much faster than compressed writes. Using LZ4, in this case, is better than using gzip, and LZ4 compression times approach the raw I.O. times.